Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning and welcome as we continue our 53rd year of the Landon Lecture Series. Former K-State President James McCain instituted the Landon Lecture Series in 1966 when former Kansas Governor Alf Landon, the namesake for our lecture series, delivered the series' first lecture. His title was The New Challenges in International Relations. I guess we could still have that today, I suppose. Um, Governor Landon was a champion for society by proposing programs that dealt with women's suffrage, antitrust legislation, prohibition of child labor, and many other important issues of the day. He was not only prepared, but inspired to address challenging issues, just as we continue to be today. This is why the lecture series exists, to bring prominent thought leaders to Kansas State University to discuss pressing issues and topics that stimulate thought and provoke discussion. Today, we are very pleased to welcome U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue, to the Landon Podium as the 179th Landon Lecturer to share his thoughts and opinions on important topics impacting not only our region, but the world. Before Secretary Perdue takes the podium, I want to take a moment to introduce a few individuals in attendance. And if you would, please stand and, and wave to the crowd as I introduce you. Um, our Provost and Executive Vice President, Dr. Chuck Tabor. <laughs> Ms. Linda Cook, Ms. Linda Cook, Chair of the Landon Lecture Series and Chief of Staff in the Office of the President. <laughs> Dr. Barry Flinchball, Chair of the Landon Patrons. <laughs> and in his 47th year of teaching here at Kansas State University. Um, Ms. Becky Bonneblast, uh, President of the University Support Senate. <laughs> Dr. Spencer Wood, President of the Faculty Senate. <laughs> Ms. Jordan Keel, K-State Student Body President and Senior in Industrial Engineering. <laughs> and Ms. Lacey Pitts, K-State Student Body Vice President and Senior in Agricultural Economics. Also, the Honorable Dr. Roger Marshall, U.S. Representative for Kansas and K-State alumnus. <laughs> the Honorable Dr. Jeff Coyer, Governor of Kansas, his wife Ruth and daughter Alexandria. <laughs> the Honorable Tracy Mann, Lieutenant Governor of Kansas and a K-State alumnus. <laughs> Dr. Jackie McClaskey. Kansas Secretary of Agriculture and a an K-State alumni. <laughs> and we also have a number of staff representing members of our Kansas federal delegation, uh, those members who could not be with us here today. Uh, we thank all of you and all members of our audience for being here. Everyone has a voice in and is important to the critical conversations impacting our world. We appreciate your interest and time today. After Secretary Perdue's lecture, we will have 15 minutes dedicated to questions from the audience. So now for our speaker. Uh, Sonny Perdue grew up on a dairy uh, and diversified row crop farm in rural Georgia. His life was shaped growing up on his family's farm. He learned by experience what his father told him as a child. If you take care of the land, the land will take care of you. As a young man, he served in the US Air Force, rising to the rank of captain. He went on to earn his Doctor of Veterinary Medicine uh, degree from the University of Georgia and worked in private practice, a veterinary private practice in North Carolina. He pursued a political career next and served as a Georgia State Senator for 11 years, then was elected to two terms as Governor of Georgia from 2003 to 2011. While serving the state of Georgia, uh, Governor Perdue was recognized as a leading authority on issues including energy, utilities, agriculture, transportation, emerging technology, and economic development. He then followed his public service with a successful career in agribusiness, focusing on commodities and transportation in enterprises that have spanned the southeastern United States. From childhood through life in business and elected office, Secretary Perdue has experienced agriculture from every possible perspective, which helped prepare him for his current role as the 31st United States Secretary of Agriculture. Secretary Perdue has been married to Mary Ruff Perdue for 45 years and has four adult children and 
14 grandchildren. He and his wife have served as foster parents for eight children awaiting adoption. Secretary Purdue remains a licensed airplane and helicopter pilot and an avid outdoor sportsman. As a leader in global food systems, Kansas State University welcomes the opportunity to bring the nation's top agricultural official to campus. Secretary Purdue's visit to Kansas State continues tradition of hosting at least one U.S. Secretary of Agriculture from each president's cabinet since the Nixon administration. It's an honor to continue that tradition today. The historical connection between the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Kansas State University goes back uh, over 150 years. Two pieces of legislation that created these two organizations were signed by President Abraham Lincoln in 1862. President Lincoln called the Department of Agriculture, quote, the People's Department, since the USDA touches the lives of every American every day through the foods and nutritional products produced through agriculture. Lincoln established the Morrell Act, of course, to meet the growing demand for agriculture and technical education in the United States. The legislation generated land-grant institutions like K-State that provide access to a practical and quality education for Kansans, Americans, and international students. I would hope that if President Lincoln were here today, he would call Kansas State the People's University. Through research, education, conservation, and countless initiatives, the USDA and Kansas State have served all people every day. In Manhattan, the USDA has five research divisions and over 100 employees, many of whom are on our faculty or have uh, appointments to our faculty. I would be remiss not to mention the Kansas Department of Agriculture, the nation's first Department of Agriculture, which was founded in 1862 and calls Manhattan home with 125 employees. The USDA, the KDA, and Kansas State community continue to serve our world in an alliance that started over 150 years ago. It, could be not, it couldn't be more perfect for Secretary Purdue to join us here today to share his perspective on the changes in our country and around the world in today's Landon lecture, quote, leave it better than you found it, lessons in public service I learned on the farm. Please help me welcome, a rousing welcome for our U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, Secretary Sonny Purdue. Thank you all. Thank you so much. And President Myers, I want to tell you what an honor it is here to be here at Kansas State at this uh, venerable lecture series that's going on for a number of years now. And I'm uh, truly uh, thrilled to be here once again on campus to see uh, uh, all the things that you're doing to visit with your students and uh, to participate uh, in the Landon Lecture Series. And I want to thank you for... Uh, assuming this role as leadership of this great university, but also your great leadership as the 15th chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Thank you for your service in keeping us safe uh, in the United States of America. Dr. Flinchbaum, where are you? It's good to see you again. We visited there uh, earlier, and uh, it's uh, great to see you. And again, uh, the Energizer Bunny here keeps uh, inspiring students, so uh, we're uh, happy to hear you. We've had a wonderful time at the round table uh, back last May in the Department of Agriculture and uh, it's just inspiring to see what someone with so much dedication and heart to see students continue to thrive and in, uh, in agriculture so you are certainly a legend here at K-State and around across our nation uh, I, I need to be confess to you though when I was uh, asked uh, to participate in this lecture series uh, I don't know that I consider it an ask when the chairman of the Senate Ag Committee uh, invites you to participate in the Landon Lecture Series, General Myers. You know it's not just necessarily an invitation, it's a command performance. So uh, I regret that uh, Senator Roberts is not able to be with us here today, but he's uh, doing his job across the uh, way and uh, working with our customers and Japan and others, uh, continuing to uh, uh, help to... Uh, make agriculture all that it can be uh, around the world. So uh, I appreciate very much uh, his, uh, his invitation and his participation and his contribution 
uh, to our nation through his service there and certainly in our area as chairman of the Senate Ag Committee. So uh, I also had a wonderful visit last uh, spring with Senator Moran here as we toured MBATH and uh, uh, again with uh, Congressman Roger Marshall when we went to Fort Riley for the uh, Memorial Day celebration, which was very moving. I know he's a K-State alumnus there that you're proud of as well. And I want to thank Governor Collier and uh, his family for providing transportation here this morning and uh, the fellowship and the relationship that we can have as he, uh, as he uh, works to make uh, Kansas uh, everything that can be. We talked about a lot of exciting new potential uh, opportunities here in Kansas, and we look forward to working with him as well, and as well as Lieutenant uh, Governor uh, Mann and uh, uh, my friend Dr. Jackie McClaskey, who's a real uh, uh, warrior for agriculture. They are well known, certainly within USDA as, uh, and across the country there. So many distinguished leaders and guests here today of the Landon Lecture Series. It's an it truly is an honor. I want, to, I want to just say that. It's an honor to be here, to be able to participate in this and to, and to have uh, had the opportunity to speak to uh, this, uh, this group. Uh, and beginning with really the one for whom this uh, uh, series was named, your late governor, uh, Landon, in 1966, it's been a great history and a great, uh, uh, a great series of lectures throughout that period of time. I know that... Uh, Governor Langdon's daughter, Senator Castlebaum, typically tries to come, and I regret that she's not able to be with us today, but I want her to know that she's in our thoughts and our thanks and for her participation in the, the course of our country as well. So thank you, uh, Senator, for your contribution to Kansas and to the United States. So let me thank the patrons also of this, uh, this series. You're, these things just don't continue happening. Things like this just don't, just don't happen on an ongoing basis unless somebody really cares and the patrons of this is uh, thank you for the investment in the future that you're making uh, in continuing this series. So I truly believe you're giving our, your students and faculty and community leaders an opportunity to hear from speakers who uh, will hold diverse uh, perspectives on many issues and really that's uh, when you think about uh, what the role of a university is I believe that's still the role. You can't really tr gain a, a full and well-rounded education without exposure to different points of view and different ideas, and I appreciate the Landon series uh, being able to continue that as well. The open exchange of ideas has been sort of the bedrock of rest, Western civilization uh, for many years now, and I think it's uh, built in the very foundation of America, and I don't want to see that go away. I think universities need to embrace that and to encourage that and facilitate that. So. Our founding fathers created this uh, constitution with checks and balances, and they knew that open and the candid exchange of ideas and different views and uh, was the, really the way to make uh, public law, was the, the best way to have, uh, truly have a government built on that individual freedom and consent of that great experiment started in uh, 1776. As we see around the world, despots and dictators have tried to uh, snuff that out in many places and to silence any voices, does not march in lockstep with their own. We see the sad examples of that around the world and those going on even today. And uh, you know that tyrants struggle to uh, uh, strangle those ideas of ideas because they fear losing power and control and dominance. And this series is an investment in the solid higher educational experience that will hopefully enable your students to understand it's okay to think differently and outside the box about many areas. It's, I truly believe it's an investment in our country, the United States of America, as that exceptional nation of which I believe we are. So one of the reasons I think that Kansas State University is, uh, is a great university I think it helps to make America a strong and exceptional nation because of its investment in agriculture. Uh, General Myers talked about Abraham Lincoln's understanding of the benefit of the American economy and the agricultural economy and its contribution to that. So Kansas State has had a rich, rich history in perpetuating that, really being the first land-grant university created after the, after the Land-Grant Act of 1862 
while other universities had already existed and were improved by the Land Grant Act, Kansas State was the first one founded as a direct result of that act. So K-State and USDA have had a long and fruitful partnership serving both the agricultural community here in Kansas and around the world. And the research projects include many important things that contribute to our safety and our health and our future productivity as well. Take things like stem rust disease in wheat and developing training and uh, research into uh, E. coli issues like uh, STEC, uh, helping to understand more about those dreaded pathogen diseases that way. Collaborating in the International Wheat Genome uh, Sequencing Cor uh, Consortium. And then uh, isolating a gene that gives rice the resistance to the rice blast fungus, uh, which currently results in crop losses that could possibly feed up to as many as 60 million people. These are the kind of things you may not hear about on a daily basis, but they're ongoing in the labs and then in the delivery and the applied research and extension service throughout this state that uh, go viral across our country and across the world that contributes to our productivity, our economy, our health, safety, and our food security. So you're involved with other research universities as well in a multi-state effort, certainly to, to uh, deal with one of the scourges of our current culture, that's the opioid abuse in the rural areas, as well as pioneering in the 4R nutrient management scheme, the right source, at the right time, the right rate, the right place to protect and enrich the soil, reduce our nutrient runoff, phosphorus, nitrogen, and improving our water quality. These are all things that Kansas State is doing, and I applaud you for that, as you also work to bring out the best in our youth, in our youth programs through the 4-H program. When uh, I was heartened to see when the raging wildfires destroyed property and killed thousands of beef cattle here last year in southwest Kansas. It was 4-H clubs who stepped in to care for those youngest survivors and to shelter and to raise those orphan calves. That's what 4-H and 4-H service is all about. So I don't have time to list all the ways. I've tried to mention a few of the highlights, but I don't have time to list all the ways that Kansas State partners with USDA to serve our agricultural community in America. But what I want to talk to you about today is a little more, a little more retro, a little more personal, because uh, I think it has a direct correlation with the way I view public policy and my role in that, both as a former governor and as a, a now the Secretary of Agriculture in dealing with life issues and uh, dealing with uh, how we determine uh, where we go next in public policy. So I did title, as the President Myers mentioned, the title of the message is to leave it better than you found it, Lessons in Public Service I Learned on the Farm. And the farm is a great place to learn life lessons. I, I certainly understand and recognize that. So if you'll allow me the personal privilege just to share a few lessons that shape the way I look at public service and public policy. And I think that first lesson really goes to the heart of responsibility and stewardship. And uh, that's important for all of us because we're part of a family, a national family, a global family here looking out for one another. And we share a, a, a sense of accountability to one another. My earliest memories of working on the farm uh, really centered about the daily chores. We were a diversified row crop farm as well as a dairy farm. And I remember probably around the age of six is what I can recall first. Uh, feeding those young calves and so either through a bucket or a bottle and helping to grow them to maturity there were replacement heifers or the things that we did there. That was the thing I did. I'd, I'd love to tell you that uh, uh, I did that out of my sense of uh, responsibility. I frankly, uh, uh, that wasn't the reason. I did it because my daddy told me and I didn't think I had a choice. <laughs> but uh, when I was eight, I got to a promotion to driving the watermelon wagon. My father loved uh, uh, fruit crops, truck crops, vegetables, and uh, he loved watermelons and cantaloupes. And, uh, and then when I was about 12, eight, 10 or 12, I started uh, really driving the tractor, plowing, planting, and those kind of things. But what I learned about the, the law of the land and law of agriculture, I think, set my uh, soul on fire for the rest of my life to understand 
how decently in order you have to do things in agriculture to survive. And that's really the way it is with life. I think these chores built into me a sense of responsibility. Those calves had to be fed every day, rain or shine, hot or cold, and they were counting on me. Uh, and if I did not do my part, then they were the ones that suffered. So, uh, as I said, I don't think it was necessarily a deeper level of critical thinking that was my motivation, but uh, uh, my father had other ways to motivate me. Uh, but as I got a little older, I did begin to think about a different level, and I recall a very valuable lesson that my father taught me, probably when I was in that middle, late teenage stage when you typically begin to think that you're smarter than your parents. I think most of us have gone through that stage, and some of you may be there now, but you will learn. Uh, I was in my teens, and uh, I thought I could make decisions about the farm. My father told me to call the uh, farm supply company and order lime for one of the fields where we were renting. We owned land there, but we also rented land around from neighbors and landowners around us, and he wanted me to order the lime for fields that we were renting. And uh, I, I, I looked at the expense and I also knew that we were, uh, I had an idea that could really save us and help our operation. Uh, I went to him and I said, Daddy, we, we only have these lands rented on an annual basis and you've told me to put lime on that field that we rent. We may not even have it next year and why don't we lime the fields that we own because some of them need it just as badly. I've taken the soil samples and I know that we need some lime on some of these farms that, or the farm that we own here. And uh, what, why don't you let us do that? And I, I will never forget how he looked at me so intently and what he told me during that period of time. He said, Sonny, let me tell you something. He said, you need to understand this right now. We're all stewards. And he said, we're going to leave this life all the same way. And whether we own it or whether we rent it, we're going to leave it better than we found it. That's an image and a, something was drilled into me as a young teenager who thought he knew better about a life lesson. Suddenly my brilliant idea to selfishly help us uh, grew dim. It was one of those critical teaching moments for my father and being the good father that he was took advantage of it. For you see... When I was a young child, I did chores because I was told to. I, I knew the meaning of responsibility. I did what you were supposed to do and when you were supposed to do it and the way you were supposed to do it. When I became a teenager and thought I knew better, my father seized that teaching moment. I suddenly understood responsibility at a deeper level. I understood, I thought I knew the meaning of responsibility earlier, but then I understood the meaning of something greater, bigger than myself, and that was stewardship. The simple lesson of leave it better than you found it. Stewardship and responsibility was one lesson I learned on the farm. A second lesson that, comes to, that stays with me to this day is trust and faith. You know, our Declaration of Independence closes with a powerful sentence, and you may recall it says, and for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. The phrase in the middle of that final sentence contains ten powerful words. It quote, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. Our founders knew that there was something greater out there than ourselves. When a farmer plants a seed, it takes a lot of trust and faith. And that's really where the rubber meets the road. There's some things a farmer can do to tend a crop, and, but only God can make it rain and make a crop grow. When our nation was founded, most Americans, including men like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, were farmers. Those words in the Declaration of Independence about relying on divine providence were not just political rhetoric. The founding fathers lived out those words every planting season. They put seed in the ground and had faith that it would grow. It was not just a blind feeling of hope this works. It was trust, faith, and a firm reliance on our Creator. That firm reliance is often tested on the farm, as we know. When things do not progress like we had hoped they would, and many times they don't, you learn the lesson of persistence. When I was about eight years old, we had a 
terrible drought in Georgia. My father, like all other farmers in the area, had to keep on getting up every day and doing what he could. Kansas knows the devastation of drought. It's insidious and it's devastating and it's demoralizing. But farmers are resilient. They must bounce back when hard times hit. They must persist. And persistence proves the authenticity of trust, faith, and that firm reliance. You probably heard the saving a mountain, saying the mountain moving faith. Persistence for farmers is having that mountain moving faith even when the mountains don't move. Last year, you know well here in Kansas, the cattle farmers were devastated with wildfires. The fires raced across the prairie land, wiping out cattle, quail, wildlife in its path. And it happened almost in the blink of the eye. You couldn't almost visualize how it could happen that quickly and how it could move that fast. In the month of July 1994, another personal experience. I was teaching my son the law of the land and having put myself through college growing sweet corn, I wanted him to taste that experience. And he had had his first crop of sweet corn in the ground and it, it just looked beautiful. It was just a perfect growing season and everything was ready to be harvested. July of 1994, Tropical Storm Alberto stalled over middle Georgia where we lived and dumped 24 inches of rain in 48 hours on our farm. While he, he tried with the bags to get out and harvest that crop of sweet corn that was gonna pay for his college education, bogging up to his knees, he soon realized it was gonna be fruitless to do that and had to let that corn crop, that sweet corn crop, turned hard in the field and turned into cow feed. So Southwest Georgia was flooded, homes were destroyed, families were uprooted, the flooding made it impossible to harvest the corn and to do other things during that period of time. By the time we could get into the fields, the corn had dried up and my son experienced that moment, what all farmers know can happen to them. Just three weeks ago, as you recall, Hurricane Michael roared into the Gulf Coast of Florida left a wake of death and destruction almost incomprehensible. Cotton and pecans were going to be bumper crops there this year. Farmers were looking forward to coming out ahead and really getting back even. In a matter of hours, cotton crops were roaring. Pecan trees laden with pecans were uprooted like pulling a dandelion out of the, out of the ground and pine trees ready for that 25-year harvest, having been in the ground there, were snapped like toothpicks. And it all happened suddenly. Meteorologists told us it was coming, but there was nothing you could do except to hunker down and pick up the pieces. Cotton farmers have told me with tears in their eyes, they had a bumper crop. They had harvested some of their crop that was yielding three bales of cotton to the acre. And six hours later after the hurricane, they couldn't tell, tell where they had harvested and where they could not. That's what farmers endure. That's what they persist at. Wildfires in here in Kansas, the western and mountain states, hurricanes and floods in Texas, Louisiana, the southeast, tornadoes and prairie fires in the Midwest, drought are all facts of life that farmers face year in and year out. But farmers are resilient and persistent. When I was governor of Georgia in that period of time in 2007, we experienced another extreme and severe drought. I uh, remember looking as I rode across my homeland, soybean fields curled up, withering away with leaves browning and curling there. And I called on Georgians after we had done everything we could with conservation efforts of water use and understanding we were getting very low in our reservoirs in Atlanta that was the water source for almost five million people. And we had done everything we could, but we couldn't make it rain. So I called on Georgians to join me in prayer. In fact, I convened right there on the Capitol steps, an old-fashioned prayer meeting asking God to send the rain. You may have heard about it. There were many in the media that enjoyed laughing about the governor of Georgia. And I'll tell you who didn't laugh. Farmers didn't laugh. God didn't laugh. He just made it rain. My reasoning was not only based on my faith, but it was practical. I'd already been in our office four years and had just returned from Washington where we'd met in different policies about drought and the water crisis. During my time as governor and 
And after intensive meeting in Washington, it was apparent there was no bureaucracy in Atlanta or in Washington, D.C. who could actually make it rain. I just thought it was my responsibility to escalate it to the person who could. We've all felt like we had our back against the wall from time to time, like the gathering storm clouds and could not get any darker. Things are bleak. When things look bleak, I sometimes reflect on what Winston Churchill said, young people, in a speech to his alma mater, the Harrow School. It was October 1941, and England was engaged in the war in Europe with Germany. The United States had not yet entered the war, and in the preceding months, England had felt very much alone in the struggle, and you recall the, the pleading of the United States to the United States to help. But Churchill was feeling like the tide was turning just through his optimism and his faith and his spirit. He told these students, quote, you cannot tell from appearances how things will go. Sometime imaginations make things go out far worse than they are. Yet without imagination, not much can be done. And he continued and concluded to the students, as I will say the same thing to you today, Never get in, never give in, never, never, never. In nothing great or small, large or petty, never give in, except to convictions of honor and good sense. That, my friends, is the bedrock of persistence. Persistence is hanging on and never giving in. Which, uh, what is the rich topsoil that feeds that persistence? That's the next lesson I grown, learned growing up on the farm. You gotta be an optimist to be a farmer. I've talked about events around our nation that have demanded a resilient and a persistent attitude. Persistence is rooted in faith and covered with the topsoil of optimism. When a farmer plants a seed, the farmer has faith that it will grow, but there's also an expectation that it will grow. That's optimism. You've heard the old illustration about the glass half full or the glass half empty. I learned to be an optimist. The road through life is not always a smooth ride, Sometimes you might even find yourself in the ditch, but persistence is pushing the car out of the ditch. Optimism is believing that the road ahead will be smoother. As I was growing up, even during the hard times, I always felt that my parents believed that I would have a better and brighter future than they have, and that rubbed off me, and that's my aspiration from our 14 grandchildren, and that's why we do what we do. These are some of the lessons that I learned growing up on the farm. I repeat, responsibility and stewardship, trust and faith, persistence, and optimism. Those four lessons I learned while growing up on the farm are what influenced me in public life and service today, in public policy. As a public official, I serve the you, the people. As Secretary of Agriculture, I serve the people by faithfully administering the policies of our uh, Congress and our administration, our president. At USDA, we initiated a new motto soon after I became there because I thought it was needed in what our mission was. And it says to do right and feed everyone. With a world population that's expected to hit 9 million billion people by 2050, the feed everyone part is pretty much an imperative. We don't have a choice. And it's the do right part that we work on every day, personally and professionally. And how do we do that? I want to ensure to you all responsibility with my accountability to you, my stewardship of this job and this responsibility that USDA is the most effective and the most efficient and the most customer focused department in the federal government. I literally want USDA to be the most effective department in the United States government. When someone interacts with USDA, I want them to get accurate information in a timely manner. I want our research programs in collaboration with Kansas State and our other land grants across the country to be the best anywhere. I want us to be there for the next generation of farmers and ranchers, producers, and consumers. So when they step out with faith on optimism and a willingness to persist in making a go of it, I want our veterans programs, our new farmers programs, our women in agriculture programs, as well as all of our other programs for beginning and career farmers as well, to put the information they need in their hands and the research and the help that we can provide available to them. I want our research programs to be on the cutting edge. That's what you all do here. You probably know that I'm making some changes to 
moved some researchers out of Washington, D.C. to be closer to the people that, say, that, that they serve. Your folks here in Kansas have been encouraging to me, and Dr. McClaskey has been uh, helpful in telling your experience here in Kansas there. One of my agricultural heroes was Norman Borlaug, and you had him speak here in March of 1979, almost 40 years ago. He made this observation in his Lander Le Landon Lecture Series, and I quote, Many agricultural officers, when they receive university degrees, want to stay in the office or in the experiment station. They try to avoid going out in the field to see the problems faced by the farmer. He went on to conclude, many have received too specialized a training and suffer from scientific tunnel vision. We've got great researchers at USDA, as you do here at Kansas State, and I believe their research will be even more effective if the team is closer to the constituents and the farmers that they serve. I want our information systems to be effective. Look at organizations like many of you probably participate with, like Amazon. You go online, you click a two, couple of buttons, and two days later, uh, what you order is at your doorstep, assuming your credit card works. <clears throat> That's effective. That's effectiveness. I want to see an effective outreach for high school and college graduates to consider agriculture as a real opportunity career. Purdue University issued, uh, published a study a few years ago about the great employment opportunities in food, agriculture, renewable natural resources, and the environment. I want to see us effectively recruiting the best and the brightest for careers in agriculture. I want to see an effective forest management program for the U.S. Forest Service, which falls under USDA. With a fire funding fix in the 2018 omnibus bill, we finally got a toehold of managing things ahead of time rather than trying to catch up. We're now focusing on managing our forests rather than constantly reacting to fire, wildland fire emergencies. I want to see effective rural prosperity that affects all of us. I believe we will see a huge and transformative leap in broadband uh, availability and broadband high-speed connectivity. These are just a few of the most effective programs in the U.S. government. I only want us to be the most effective. I also want us to be the most efficient. When Ronald Reagan was governor of California, he came as your third distinguished speaker in the Land and Lecture Series. He told about establishing a Blue Ribbon Panel to look at state government operations. When I was governor of Georgia, we did much the same, calling together a group of private sector people to look at private sector principles injected that could be injected into uh, the state operation. We called it the New Georgia Commission. One thing we learned is that good government is not, it's not sexy, it doesn't get the headlines, but vo voters smell the efficiency and the effectiveness through the fragrance of good government. When you move the lines to get driver's license reduced from six hours to under 30 minutes, people notice. I'm sometimes astounded when I think about on the farmers on their combines being guided by signals from satellite but they have to come to USDA to fill out a paper form to participate in our programs. That's not effective, and it's certainly not efficient. I'm glad you all like that, yeah. Uh, so I've tasked our team at USDA, headed by our Deputy Secretary, uh, Steve Sinsky, with leading the transformation of our information systems and technology. I want USDA to be the Amazon of federal government. Along that line, we have a quiet transformation underway. We have multiple agencies within USDA with many missions. All of these agencies have unique missions, but they are still part of the large family of USDA. We're steadily working toward the goal that everyone understanding that we're one USDA. That's not to detract from the mission of each agency within our USDA, but it does unite us as a family working together to deliver that most effective, the most effect, uh, efficient customer service for our, for our citizens, our customers, the American public. Finally, as I indicated, I want to see the USDA as the most customer-focused agency in the federal government, in the U.S. government. You know, if you want us to be as efficient as Amazon, then I want to be as, as customer-focused as one of my quick-serve restaurants, Chick-fil-A. A few months ago, we had a customer experience summit at USDA, and I invited the leader from Chick-fil-A, who I'd known there as a Georgia company, as well as other companies there known for their best customer service. 
You know, it's unfortunate that government as a whole has developed such a customer unfriendly reputation. I don't expect that to be the case at USDA. The lessons I learned on the farm is what drives me there today at USDA. So I go back to that lesson of the fields. I want to leave it better than I found it. One of the reasons I took this job is really because of the future of my aspirations for our 14 grandchildren. I want to do my part in helping their future be better and brighter and helping your future be better and brighter. I want to see these 4-H and FFA kids here. I want to encourage them about their future, to tell them that they're not only leaders today, but not somewhere out there in the future, but they can be leaders today. I have a certain sense of urgency about leaving it better than I found it. And let me close with another lesson from my childhood that reflects on that sense of urgency. You know, we had uh, farm help there on the, on the farm when I was growing up. I worked side by side. They were our closest neighbors. I lived, we lived next to one another. We played with each other. And we were best friends. One of those boys was a young African-American named Hollis. He was just a couple of years older than I. But we were best buddies. We did everything together. But when Hollis was about 10 years old, he passed away. I was too young to understand or to know what happened, but I did. It was my first response personally with death and how that affected me as an eight-year-old. I don't remember how long I cried over losing my best friend Hollis, but I remember it was devastating to me personally. Folks, life comes to us one moment at a time. None of us is promised tomorrow or even the next minute for that matter. I've been blessed to learn some great lessons growing up on the farm. I learned stewardship and faith, persistence and optimism. As your Secretary of Agriculture, once again, I want the USDA to be the most efficient, the most effective, the most customer focused department in the federal government. I truly want to leave it better than I found it. And I always want us to do right and feed everyone. God bless you, God bless Kansas State University, and God bless America. Thank you. Secretary, thank you so much. Life lessons, um, well learned, inspiring, and uh, thank you for your vision for USDA that you're leading right now. That's going to help us all. So uh, we have time for questions. We have microphones on both sides. And uh, as soon as I spot somebody at one of the microphones, we'll alternate sides is the way we'll do it. Okay, over here, please. Dad, please state your name and uh, your affiliation and uh, ask your question. Good morning, Secretary Purdue. My name is Alan Hines. I'm a student here at Kansas State in Agricultural Economics Pre-Law. Uh, thank you for your very inspiring words today and educational lecture. Uh, so there's many current and future leaders in agriculture in the room today. What do you see as the largest struggle for our future leaders in agriculture as we try to leave agriculture better than we found it, and how can we overcome this struggle? Again, I think many of the qualities that I talked about learning on the farm, it takes, uh, it takes persistence, it takes optimism, and it takes a, a culture of can-do. I think that's what I see in farmers, have seen in there for a long time, never, never, never give up, uh, Churchill said, and that's what farmers have to do on an ongoing basis. It takes an understanding that our, cons our customer base is changing uh, while we can't, while we have to rely on the lessons of the past, we've got to look to the future of understanding their different customer demands. Our consumers today want to know not only that food is healthy and safe and, and affordable and nutritious, they want to know everything that went into it. Uh, with uh, social media today, there are a lot, there's a lot of mis misinformation. We've got to learn in agriculture to be great communicators. We ought to be proud uh, of our stewardship. We ought to be proud of the way we produce the safest, most healthy, most affordable food supply in the world. And we ought to be able to communicate. We need to communicate that through various means today. So I think the challenge is communicating what we do, operating transparently. No longer can we stand behind the farm gate and say, 
You know, I just grow it, you eat it. We've got to get out here and be marketers of what we do, and we ought to be proud of how we do it. That's why it's important to uh, be socially minded and nutrient runoff and other types of things, animal welfare issues and other things, to do things uh, uh, honorably and, and uh, in a good way. So I think those are the challenges as agriculture, as consumption changes, we've got to do things in a different way in that regard, being more open and more transparent. Ms. Secretary, we have a question here on our right. My name is Mark Zarbnicki. I'm a senior in mechanical engineering here at K-State. Um, my question was, uh, obviously Kansas and many other states' economies are focused around agriculture. And in your position, you're an advocate for the American agricultural market. Um, in fact, on your profile on the White House's website, it states it should be the aim of the American government to remove every obstacle and give farmers, ranchers, and producers every opportunity to prosper. Uh, recently in the same lecture series, Senator Moran spoke about some concerns that he had regarding the current administration's trade war and uh, removal from trade, international trade agreements and how they may affect Kansas and farmers nationwide. Sure. Uh, I, in a uh, July 25th op-ed, uh, you backed these current policies and I was just curious, in your opinion, uh, to what extent and when will American producers and farmers see the results of these policies? And uh, if not, uh, what are you doing to further policy to uh, help the American farmer? Sure. Thank you. A good question. Obviously, there's a lot of concern and anxiety as there is to be expected over trade disruption policy. Farmers are great growers. and. Uh, uh, they need help marketing. That's one of the roles of USDA. Uh, to his credit, uh, I think Senator Moran and I both were concerned about the market disruption of tariffs, but I think since the time that he spoke, we've seen some uh, vindication and validation of the President's strategy regarding a renewal and a better renewal of the NAFTA agreement that many people felt like had been great for a number of years in agriculture. It had been. It's even better now with a new uh, USMCA agreement going on. We renewed the Korean agreement and locked in that market. And we're now moving to the European Union and to Japan, other big customers there that we, allies that we can rely on. China remains a question mark. Uh, the United States and agri United States agriculture is willing to deal with China and trade with China anytime China recognizes that its, that its protocols and processes and procedures of illegally attaining intellectual property even rice seeds here in Kansas, if you remember, uh, corn seeds in, uh, in Iowa, those kind of things. China needs to play by the rules. Farmers are honest people. We want people to be compliant and play by the rules. So when China decides that it wants to play by the international rules of fairness and free trade, we want to trade with them any time. I think President Trump's policies are getting that message across. I think the Chinese economy is understanding that it needs this huge consumer base here. When you look at a $350 billion trade deficit, the president's very concerned that that's transferring wealth here and building up a, a, a second power that wants to dominate the world economy. It's a long game. And I think what we see with these policies of President Trump's negotiating strategy, people are understanding we will no longer just be the patsies of international trade, but we'll be the dominant to, for us going forward, and that's what he has in mind as far as the future of young people in agriculture. I think we have another question on, on our right, uh, Ms. Secretary. Uh, good morning, Mr. Secretary. I'm Larry Miles. I'm K-State State Forester. I want to thank you very much for Jim Hubbard as your Undersecretary for the U.S. Forest Service. Also want to thank you very much for the State and Private Forestry Division of the U.S. Forest Service. And you mentioned the wildfire several times through the relationship of USDA and the Department of Defense. We now have 486 volunteer rural fire districts across the state of Kansas that are the first responders to the wildfires that we have been experiencing. Also want to thank you for the Forest Service Research Program because we rely heavily on the outcome of those research. And in that regard, if you'll wish to send best wishes to Mr. Hubbard, who, by the way, came as state forester from another Forest Service that's under the land-grant system at Colorado State. So thank mm -hmm. you for being here and for the work you're doing. 
Well, thank you. I think uh, your remarks are a good indication that we can't do it alone. And while we've been uh, tried to be self-sufficient in the U.S. Forest Service for a number of years, you know our good neighbor authority now relies on uh, our state partners. Fire, wildfire knows no boundaries, whether it's public, private, or uh, Forest Service land or BLM or anything. It just rages across. And so congratulations on the number of first responders there. Our goal is to be good neighbors and more than just name only, but to really work as neighbors, helping neighbors just like farmers and ranchers do uh, already uh, in, in the fire service. So I appreciate the relationship. It's uh, one of the reasons we chose uh, Jim Hubbard, and you mentioned uh, our new chief as well. Vicki Christensen was also a, a state forester for her career, most of her career. And so we want to have relationships. It's just like... Uh, good research you got to have collaboration and working together and good protocols of how we respond and i appreciate the i appreciate your comments but i appreciate the relationship that we're uh engaging in with our state partners thank you by the way i have a president voting for you in 20, 2003 <laughs> out of georgia so. <laughs> thank you i think <laughs> i'm looking left and right are there any more questions Mr. President, I think they're done. I think. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. We appreciate it.